Welcome back, panelistas. This is the second video in my hybrid DML build, and today I'm going to take a look at the panel itself. I'll be taking measurements with various configurations, including balsa wood bracing, counterweights on the resonance nodes, and then two different exciters mounted in several different positions. As I mentioned in the previous video, my other design choices kind of compel me to use a 400 by 600 millimeter panel. Based on previous experience with my Goldie speakers, I'm again going with acrylic, but this time in a thinner three millimeter thickness, which is down from 4.5 millimeter in the Goldie build. I made this choice once I started to think about decay. So decay is basically a measure of how quickly a speaker stops making noise when the signal stops. When audiophiles talk about having a fast pair of speakers, they're talking about decay. The idea is that a speaker should only be producing sound when the amplifier tells it to, and should stop playing as soon as the signal ends. If too much energy is stored in the speaker, it will take longer to stop vibrating, and this leads to a sort of muddier or more opaque overall sound. This is why driver cones come in all sorts of exotic lightweight materials. Of course, the issue is going to be more pronounced with a large heavy panel. So one of my original design choices was to make use of a lighter panel, which I'm doing through my use of a smaller and thinner panel overall. To illustrate this, I'll be showing waterfall decay measurements for my panels alongside the usual frequency response measurements. Those who have seen my previous build videos might notice that these frequency response graphs look a lot better than the previous ones, and I have you guys to thank for that. Several commenters have recommended that I learn to use gating in my measurements, and I've finally gotten around to doing it. So gating the signal is essentially removing the response caused by room reflections or sources other than the original speaker source. Well-equipped speaker designers do this by measuring their products in anechoic chambers, but most of us have to settle for this digital version. So anyway, I found the optimal settings for my test setup, and the results are much flatter and more in line with how they actually sound. The difference isn't subtle, but it is better, and it is more accurate. I'd call that a win. Okay, first I'm going to compare the plain, unmolested panel to one with a guitar-style bracing. So now it's over to me in the high-tech measuring lab for more info. Okay, here's the braced panel that I prepared earlier. It is made out of the same 3mm acrylic as the other panel. The difference being, obviously, that I've stuck on this bracing. This is just balsa wood from the hobby store. Uh, a couple of little extra braces that I bought off eBay. Uh, I think they're from a ukulele kit or something like that. Uh, and then I've just stuck it on the panel using a two-part epoxy adhesive. On this build, I did want to go to a thinner panel because thin is light. And light means that the exciter can have better control over the panel. The obvious downside though is the flex, so as you can see, this one's actually really stiff now. Uh, let's see if that makes any noticeable difference. So here's my test panel on the frame, ready to go. Got the gear, I've done the talking bit. Let's go do some measurements. First off, I'm setting my usual view parameters and applying the usual 1 12th of an octave smoothing to the graph. Here's an ugly set of lines that evidently include quite a lot of room reflection. Of course, I know that now that I've bothered to learn. So let's apply some appropriate gating for a more pure signal. Nice. 
we've lost the worst of the reflections. Now you can see that almost all the action is happening between 70 and 80 decibels. So in this case, I took three measurements each of the braced and the unbraced panel, so I could average them. I'm not sure why I did. I don't usually bother because, well, it's kind of tedious. Anyway, here are the two averages. So you can see that the bracing hasn't actually had much of an effect on the frequency response at all but it has reduced the overall efficiency of the panel, being down between one and two decibels through most of the range. That's not a particularly exciting result. Of course, you might also expect the stiffer braced panel to exhibit a faster decay time due to the damping effect of the bracing. Well, at least I did. In hindsight, I'm not sure why. Taking a look at the waterfall graph confirms that oh, I'm an idiot. When looking at the waterfall, the top edge of the graphic represents the frequency response line with all of the same peaks and dips, although you'll notice here it's slightly exaggerated just due to the different scale. The z-axis shows the decay time in milliseconds. So for any given frequency, we can see the volume of the original signal and how long it took for the energy to dissipate. You can see that the decay time is better than 300 milliseconds at all frequencies here, with some of the measurement being sub 200 milliseconds. For some context, my previous acrylic panels varied between 4 to 500 milliseconds, and my original bamboo panels were slightly worse than that. So the main takeaway is, this is a win. But looking at the braced panel now, we can see it's actually very slightly worse and has this nasty resonance at around 200 Hz. Now, 200 is below my planned crossover frequency, but probably not enough to eliminate this altogether. So why does this result make me an idiot? Well, because I'd read about how bracing in guitars is used both to strengthen the guitar and help the whole top to resonate more efficiently. Yet for some reason, I expected it to reduce resonance in my panels. The proof is in the acoustic measurement. It hasn't helped. I'm actually not too disappointed by this result, as I was quite wary of gluing these to my final set of panels, for reasons that will become clear in a future video. So as far as panel rigidity goes, I'm going to forget the bracing, I'm going to go back to my previous method of adding additional attachment points between the panel and the frame. Now it's back over to me again to talk about tech ingredients. So as I mentioned earlier, I've gone back and I've re-watched one of those old tech ingredients videos. I was specifically interested in the section where he's using the Cladney plates. Uh, to show the, the various um, vibration modes in the material. And then he goes on to place weights at various points on the plate uh, and shows that that actually uh, reduces by quite a lot the peaks in the frequency response. So I just want to try that on the same panel. I'm not going to reinvent the wheel here. I'm going to use the exact same proportions and everything as they did in that video and see if that smooths out my response at all. I've put some paper underneath the panel so you can see the lines a bit better. And basically I've got my main two-fifths, three-fifths marked out here so the exciter lives in that circle. And then each rectangle that, uh, each division of the panel that's created by those lines further gets divided uh, so I find the two-fifths, three-fifths in each area. And you can see I've marked out where the weights should go. So what I'm doing is I've just got these magnets, um, stackable obviously because they're magnets, and I'm using them to attract each other through the material at those points like that. Um, so what I can do, I'll, I'll try this. If there's no meaningful results, I'll stack more. And 
see how we go adding mass that way. Um, nice thing about this, obviously, it's not permanent, so easy to adjust, easy to remove. Whether it actually works or not is another story. We're about to find out. Okay, so once again, we have this same overall shape and it continues to make me pretty happy. Adding the red line, which indicates three magnets per side per node, we can once again see that the difference is pretty minor, but actually slightly worse. By worse, I mean that the dips are slightly deeper and the peaks are slightly higher. So overall, it's a bit more uneven. Now, if I add the green line, that's six magnets per side. You can see that it's again really close to the other. Switching to a super smooth visualization highlights the increased flatness of the original purple line. So once again, the plane panel looks best. And what about the waterfall? Well, there's not much in it, but the weights obviously aren't doing anything to decrease resonance. In fact, Again, it's slightly worse at the low end. Basically the exact same result as the bracing. I'm starting to see a pattern here. So as I said, I've decided to forget about complicated bracing and weighting of the panel and just go back to my previous method of adding additional attachment points. And while I'm doing that in the background, I guess I should address my panel corners briefly. So conventional wisdom says that you should round your panel corners because it can help reduce a sort of standing waves by evenly dispersing vibration modes that reach those corners. Everyone says to do it. I did it on my free hanging panels and I suspect that it's probably true. But I'm not doing it on my rigid panels. Screwing these panels directly into the frame effectively damps the corners anyway as they're not free to vibrate like corners of hanging panels would be. So any vibrational waves that travel towards the corners are being robbed of their energy and won't reflect back with any strength. You can see this in the waterfall graphs. There are no nasty resonances at any frequency really. It's just something to keep in mind. Conventional wisdom isn't going to be right in every single case. If you've made it this far without falling asleep, congrats. You obviously have the focus of a grandmaster. This is the final set of measurements. Using the Thruster 40 Watt Exciter, I measured the response in three different positions. The traditional 2 fifths, 3 fifths position, the 3 quarter and centered position that I used in my Goldie panels, and the wildcard, the three-quarter, three-quarter position, just for fun. I then did the same with the 40 watt steered flux exciter to see which model was best suited to my panels. Once again, the measurements are only subtly different. The green line is the two-fifths, three-fifths position. It looks pretty good. But the three-quarter and center position actually looks slightly better, again. You can see this also in the very smoothed graph. The purple line is slightly flatter overall, although I do admit there's not much in it. Now let's compare it to the wildcard. Nope. The orange three-quarter, three-quarter line is definitely worse. So I'm calling it here for the three-quarter and center position. And that's where I'll be sticking my drivers. And finally, here's an interesting one. Now I'm comparing the thruster with the steered flux driver, both in that three-quarter and centered position. Which one would you choose? The mid-base and mid-range are virtually identical, as is the extreme high-frequency range. But what about this region between 1000 and 5000 Hz? For me, going back to the extreme smoothing tells the story a bit better. While the blue steered flux has the physically straighter line, it is sloping upwards the whole way, where the purple thruster 
seems overall very flat from around 500 Hz upwards. It also has slightly more going on below 300 Hz. I'd say it's the winner by a narrow margin. And there's also another reason to prefer it. The thruster is physically lighter and shallower than the steered flux exciter, meaning that it won't exert as much pulling force on the back of the panel as the heavier model. For a braced driver design, this wouldn't really be a factor, but I'm not planning to brace mine. Now finally, let's take a quick peek at the waterfall. Again, the thruster comes out slightly ahead with a very uniform and fast overall decay. The steered flux isn't quite as clean with this resonance again at around 200 Hertz and I think slightly less overall consistency. So that's it. Long story short, I'll be using a single Dayton thruster exciter for each panel and I'll be placing it in the three quarter and centered position. I won't be using additional bracing or counterweights, but I will go for six points of frame attachment as this combination seems to yield the best overall result. Thanks for watching and as always, please hit me up with any questions, comments or other feedback. And if you'd like to see where all this is actually going, please consider subscribing to find out. I'll see you next time.